1987, I'm working as an artist, making uh, stained glass and painting pictures and so on. That's what I loved at the time. I still like it, but then I loved it. And so uh, it was a passion for me, painting, drawing, exhibiting my work and so on. Also, I worked for some times on the streets in London, making portraits of tourists. Maybe one of you might be here, I don't know. <laughs> in those days, you see. But I started working and exhibiting my work. And I was asked to help to put on an exhibition called Five Jamaican Artists at the time. And uh, this I was uh, helping to put on. When I returned home one evening, my partner at the time, she said, Oh, um, somebody came earlier today. They saw the stained glass in the window and they said, you know, who, who made that glass? Because it was clearly a modern piece. And she says, oh, my boyfriend made it, and, uh, but he's not here right now. And this person said, I would like to meet him because I myself am making stained glass. So that was the first message I got when I got home. I said, okay, fine, it's good. And I ate my uh, dinner and then knocked on the door and this young man showed up. Hi, how are you? Hey, you came earlier, nice to meet you. Please come in. And we started just to talk. But quickly, in the space of maybe four or five exchange of sentences, he uh, told me, you know, I'm a practicing Christian. I live just near to your house. And in fact, my house where I live, uh, we use as a church, actually. And uh, so that's what, that is my, that's my life, I can say. But I also make paintings and stained glass and so on. Ah, so I was curious. I'm making an um, exhibition, uh, Afro-Caribbean artist. He was an Afro-Caribbean man. And okay, fine. Uh, would you like to participate? Now, he was not so keen to participate, but he was more like he wanted to be with me. He wanted to meet me. So much interest in, in being with me. And so we talked and talked, and I found it very, very comfortable to talk with him. I felt, uh, I asked some questions, spiritual questions came up very easily and I spoke with him and he addressed my, my, my views and my doubts and so on to satisfy me. I don't remember exactly what those were, but um, we talked and I liked talking with him. And that was it. Uh, if I'm putting it in the shortest way, then I would say that I would reflect on what we talked about at the time and whenever I felt I would like to see him, he would just show up. Like this. I didn't make an appointment. He didn't have a phone. I don't have a phone. I would just think, yeah, I'd like to see Michael. And he would just pop, pop, pop on the door. Hi, how are you? I said, whoa, look at this. And again, we'd keep our conversations going. And that went on for about uh, maybe two months or so. I'm not sure about that. But for some time, we kept seeing each other and talking. And it came one Sunday, he came again, and we were like four people in the house, one friend of his and uh, my partner, myself and himself. We had finished talking. It was so enriching, the experience of sharing with him, that as he was about to leave, I said to him, Michael, when you pray again, could you, could you pray for me? I asked like that. And he said, yes, but why not right now? I said, oh, okay. So we stood up and he stood up next to me, put his hand on my head and prayed. I don't remember exactly what he said, but I just was there. I did. Then as he finished praying, myself also, I said, please uh, help me, you know, like help me to, to come more deeply into this understanding. I offer my heart to like this. And then we finished, felt very good. Had a hug at the door, by Michael, by David, and they left. Close the door. I felt so good. I felt very happy, very light. Just that was it. The most complete meeting, satisfied. I felt so, and I kept on feeling unusually light and happy. It was so good. I didn't want this evening and this feeling to go away. I stayed up very, very late, and then somehow 
sleep came. I didn't want sleep to come. I felt if I fell asleep, I would wake up, it would be finished. But I woke up the next morning and it was still there, the feeling in my body, tingling, very sensitive and noticing the sunlight coming through the, the opening in the curtains and it was like looking like I'd never seen the sun before or this type of feeling, as though some sensitivity in me had been turned up very high and I felt marvellously happy. After another day of this, a deep peace came inside my heart and that has never gone away. It has never gone away. Many things happened from that period until now. Many things happened. But this peace has never gone away. The sense of myself, my egoic tendencies and behaviors continued for a little bit because uh, it doesn't, didn't just disappear. I was still making mistakes, but I was so in my heart dedicated to truth. I felt I, that's the only thing that mattered now. Every, all my other interests began to fall away because the feeling inside was so compelling, so beautiful, so rich, so complete. I wanted to offer my life. I said, please take, take it, take my life, take it in exchange for, for this. Give me more of this. I want more of this. You take the, my, my ugly bits <laughs> and leave just the beautiful things. It was like that. But it doesn't work like that. Gradually, you know, things begin to change and more and more you know, it's going out like that. And uh, Oh, we okay. So, um, so that brings another question in my mind when we, you were talking, that can you give us some those short practices which you have been doing since then, which has uplifted you and brought you to this level? What are those practices and can you give us some tips on that? I was going to explain something that is much more fantastic than a practice. It was the next part of my story. <laughs> I am trying to make it as simple as possible because you asked me, <laughs> you see? And so what happened is that uh, after some point, I was never reading books. I don't read many books. If you saw me with a book, it's because it had pictures in it. I like pictures, <laughs> and pictures no? but writing, no. And so uh, I did not have much reading background. But uh, having met Michael, I read the entire Bible by myself again from start to finish. I was hungry for some kind of knowledge of what was happening to me. And uh, finally, I went to one bookshop and I found a book. The first one was on Ramana Maharishi, but I could not understand his words. They were on self-inquiry and it felt very alien to me. But I found another book called The Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. And I was attracted to it because it said gospel. And that reminded me more of like Christian gospel, so I didn't feel I was going too far away. And I loved Ramakrishna. I discovered I loved Ramakrishna. He helped a lot to explain what was happening inside my heart. And uh, so some. A while later, I was called to do uh, some work for one of my, my elder sister. I made some decoration in her house and she gave me the largest sum of money I'd ever experienced, like uh, three and a half thousand pounds. I never had that kind of money in my hand. And within two weeks, I was on a plane to India. <laughs> yeah, knew nothing about India. I arrived in Delhi uh, with no you know, Lonely Planet Guide or nothing like that. You know, just arrive in Delhi, and in Delhi for about seven days. And then in Delhi, in this little guest house, I saw it says, um, Coach Rides to Rishikesh. I'd heard this name, Rishikesh. I said, I'll go for one weekend. So I packed, packed a small bag and left all my luggage in the hotel, and I took a bus, and came to Rishikesh, and came off at Laxmanjula up there, up at the top. And uh, I came here, and then I never went back for my bags in, in Delhi for six months. <laughs> so I came here and uh, like this, uh, came to Rishikesh. Then one day coming up from the Ganga, 
Some people, uh, the place at Laxmanjula, where there's no cars anymore there. It's just as far as you can go at the top. And uh, at those, those days, cars could come. One car was stopped there. I was walking with some local friends and some people were in the car asking for directions. And while they was talking to the driver, Indian driver, some Europeans in the back, in the back seat looked out towards me and says, hey, I remember you like this. And I was new in India. He says, me? No, 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 you don't know me. And then, yeah, I remember you. And then the woman looked out and she goes, ah, it's you, I remember you. I was saying, no, 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 you don't remember me, you know, like this, no? Then the driver, Indian driver, looks says, yeah, yeah, I know him, I know him. <laughs> I said, what is this? What is this? No, no, I don't know these people. And then I said, no, no, maybe somebody looked like me, beard and... And then they left and laughing and they left, they ride back up. When I walked up to my hotel, they were getting off at my hotel, unpacking. So again we met and they said, please, you must have dinner with us. I had dinner with them and they told me, our Guruji is strongly associated with this region. His name is Sri Punja, Papaji. I never heard of any Papaji. They said, please come and have a meal with us. So we had a meal. They showed me Papaji's book called Wake Up and Roar. But uh, I was just polite, you know, saying, oh, it's very nice, very nice. But I, I didn't feel anything. The next morning they're leaving. They said they only came for a day. Next morning they're leaving. The driver was also a devotee of Papaji. I mistook him for just taxi driver. They were all going back. They insisted that I come back with them to Lucknow. I said, uh, no, I wanted to go to Varanasi first. And they pleaded and pleaded. I don't know why they were so insisting on me. But they went. And I felt I need to go to, Lak to Varanasi first. But as soon as they left, I felt I needed to leave Rishikesh. I went to Varanasi for 10 days. And I uh, arrived in, in Lucknow 10 days later. I met Papaji for the first time. And uh, I met Papaji. I spent several months with him. One day in satsang, I wrote a letter to him to introduce myself. Um, I felt I had, uh, I had uh, come to some experiences spiritually and I wanted to share with him. He called me up in satsang and uh, I went up to sit in front of him. And he murdered me basically. And that was uh, <laughs> he was, uh, he was talking, talking with me and a strong, fierce resistance was coming up inside my heart. Like, you, who are you speaking? You don't know me. And, blah, 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 and look at uh, you. Like this, because I felt like he caught something inside me that was something very unpleasant that I could not see myself. But by the power of his grace, something was caught in his light. And he was talking and he said, if you wish to know the truth, you must vanish. What kind of instruction is that? You know, I mean, uh, how do you vanish? You know, you can't vanish. And there was all this resistance. The, the, the resistance inside was coming up so loud that I could not physically hear him. I was looking at him talk. Inside, I was like that. So it was not a pleasant experience for me. And at the end of satsang, I just in decided I'm leaving Lucknow. It was more like bad luck now. I didn't feel like it was luck now. And I went home, started to pack my bags. I'm going. That, that was the sign I was waiting for. I'd spent enough time, wasted enough time. I'm leaving. Furious. But it was a very hot day. And I decided to go to get some fresh air. I was like, inside my body was like frying 10 sausages or something. I was just oh, shh. I went for a walk, I sat in the village for a while, and then I decided to go home and pack my clothes. And as I walked for about 10 meters, suddenly everything disappeared. Everything disappeared. What do I mean by everything disappeared? Including myself. Now, it's a funny thing to say that, because I was still here. 
but the idea I had of myself, my history, who I think I am, I could not find anything of my person. It was amazing. It was just there was just space, like space. I could see uh, the traffic on the road. I could see everything. It's like they were moving in some kind of slow motion or something. And I was looking at my hand. I kept looking at the hand, and it was like there was nobody in them. Like there was nobody in this body. But there was something was here to see that. I wonder what that is, you might find out. What was there to witness the absence of myself? Myself being who I think I am. <clears throat> my story, my history, my relationships, my values in life, my desires for future. Nothing was there at all. And then in this vast space of beingness, the Master's face came to me. And it was so amazing. I realized in that moment, I would met my Master. Who I was to say that, I can't tell you. Hmm? And uh, that was the, the second great blast of a kind of awakening in, in, in this body that took place. And then, I, of course, I did not leave. I unpacked my bag and I stayed on with Papaji for some time until a feeling came to go to Tiruvannamalai in the south of India, where Ramana Maharshi lived, uh, lived for some time. And that's it. That's all I need to tell you. <laughs> Be girls, you know. I have one Tony here. She's a girl, but she's also a girl. <laughs> Nickname. Tony. Your name, a nickname or name, Tony? Is a nickname your parents call you? Her name? The name is Anthony, but uh, it's shortened uh, to Tony. Uh, Tony. <coughs> My spiritual awakening began six years ago. After a prayer, my whole life and nature underwent a great change. Inwardly and outwardly. There wasn't any real effort for me except my consistent trusting in that thing within which was making me feel safe. It was then that my real faith in God began. I found that I could talk with God freely, intimately, that I was being loved and guided from within and without, and a great love and peace, trust arose in my heart. Since then, I have continued over the years and through much trials and tests to try and give over my will and way entirely to the Divine. I saw there was one universal spirit which was called by different names and worshipped in different ways. I prayed I might reach a place of complete surrender and merge in the Divine will or Self. 
in spite of the grace, many powerful experiences and deepening relationship with God, the vain and proud ego was not fully destroyed and continued and continued to travel. <coughs> While in Rishikesh, I met three of your devotees who told me about their wonderful Master Papaji, and now, by the grace of God, I am here at your feet. I know I was led here. I feel the presence quite strongly here flowing out from you and love of satsang family and the flame of inner peace, joy, silence, which I felt so strongly before is ablaze again. Though it had never really gone, gone out, I had heard of Sri Ramana Maharishi and notice, noticed books about him, but felt no real attraction at all towards him. Until I met you, three weeks ago, the path of self-inquiry was new to me, as my usual way of worship was self-surrender, and that felt natural to me. Still, it is the same one reality which lead me here to you. Now I feel coming before you represents my death. Dying to all the false ideas I have of myself and I feel a little afraid. Also, I experience some doubts towards you, but I am fully ready to die in my yearning to fully live. I have had enough identifying with ego, its pride, vanity, being here has enabled me to identify the culprit more clearly. I see how it has robbed me of the true light of the Self. Also, I see that somehow, all along, I have cooperated to some extent in the whole scheme. At the same time, I am always aware that the Self is there in the background, still unshakable, <coughs> silent, reassuring, and I hold on to it. Now I want you to chop off my head and put it fully into my heart, where it belongs. I don't know how. Pure, my motive is for seeking realization. I know that I want with all my heart to realize, live and abide in the true Self. I have benefited from sitting here silently in your presence. I feel things shifting, though this knot of fear within is still clearly felt. Please help. Tony. As long as one has ego in him, I don't think he can succeed in any way. Even God cannot help. If you have arrogance in your mind, ego. So, surrender, you say, surrender to God is not surrender. You have to surrender your ego. Then, this is called surrender. Then God within you is your friend. It will reveal itself to you at once. But if you go with the ego, two things cannot meet. God, you have to merge as the river merges into the ocean. Like that, you merge your ego into the divinity, 
and become one with it. That is called surrender, you see. Maintaining yourself, even this I, I pray, I go to God, I go to church, all these things will not help you. And when you go to God, surrender, remove this I from you, and then you will see how close you have been. So when praying, when sitting, when meditating, don't say, I am meditating, I am praying. So this I, you have to remove. This is cutting of the head. That story, remove the I out of the satsang hall, enter. Without I, I means body. I means body, otherwise I cannot be identified with anything else, you see. So, body, see, how this body can see the divine light. Going with the body and asking for divine pleasure, happiness, grace, is not possible. So, while praying, don't accompany the I with you. Going to satsang, don't take I with you. So if you understand what I am speaking, instantly when you remove the I, first of all you tell me who is praying whom. It is the I that has trouble. It is the I that causes suffering, you see. I suffer, you see. I am dying. <laughs> Only I is troublesome, so you have to get rid of this I. Instead of searching for God, God you can't search anywhere else, He is everywhere. Only you disappear now. Then you will see God is everywhere, you have to disappear. So you want God to appear, and also you want to appear, this is not possible. 